So today let's explore this digital stopwatch from the 80s. It has a six digit display here, the minutes, seconds and hundredths of seconds. Or this position times 100 milliseconds and this times 10 milliseconds. It's DS35, made by Pragotron. It's in a metal box. It has a handle on it, some screws from the bottom. And the cable comes in here. Let's take a look at the label here. The type number. The series number 220 volts, 50 hertz, 9 volt amps. And here is the connector for the remote control, which is unfortunately missing. It used to have a wired remote control for it. Let's try to plug it in. And zeros actually show up. It seems it could be actually working. All the Nixies are working. Well, some other digits might not work, but it's promising so far. And here's the schematic of the missing remote control. It's very simple, it should be easy to replace. It's just a connector, a four-wire cable, a switch to start and stop the stopwatch and a reset button. And some picture of it from the internet. It was just a box with a switch and a button. Nothing fancy. What if I just stick a wire in it to make it count? And it works. There seems to be absolutely nothing wrong with it. Let's leave it running a bit longer and let's see. The digit 4 in the highest position isn't working. 5 also doesn't work. 6 is probably also not working if it goes to 99 minutes, not 59. 7 is not working, but 8 is working and 9 is working. And then it goes back to zeros. But there's definitely some problem in it. Which of course means we have to open it. Two screws on the top. Some at the bottom. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to remove all. I probably have to remove the handle for the sides of it to come off. And it's nicely grounded. Every piece of metal seems to be properly grounded here. Nice. And these come out on both sides. And this comes off probably. And here's the board. And the other screws are for the board. But of course we have to take the board out anyway. You can't easily access it without removing it because this metal is all one piece. And this comes out and... Here's the board. And the mains comes in here. Here's the fuse, the transformer, some bridge rectifiers, the 7805 regulator, the connector, the smoothing capacitors, some small electrolytic capacitors here, some interference inductors, resistors, and a lot of chips. Here's one transistor, resistors. It seems to be mostly counters, six counters, six decoders, one out of ten for the Nixies. And then the Nixie is here, of course. And of course, when looking at it, what you can't see is a crystal. This is not using a crystal, it's using the minus frequency to clock it. And there are smoothing capacitors for the logic voltage, but no smoothing capacitor for the anode voltage. It's using an unsmoothed voltage. The Nixies don't require smoothing. But now, of course, let's try to fix it. Let's make it run. There seems to be a debouncing circuit and you don't actually need a two-way switch to start it and stop it. You could also use two momentary buttons instead. Of course you have to wait 40 minutes for the problem to show up, so it's a bit tricky to diagnose. Let's check some voltages in the meantime. This is the rectified low voltage secondary 9.7 volts. This goes into the 7805 regulator and about 5 volts comes out. And the anode voltage is 156 volts. But of course this would be too low for Nixies. But it's actually an unsmooth rectified voltage, which means it's pulsing and the peak level is higher. This is the average, not the peak. Here's the pulsing anode voltage, the peak level is 192 volts. Nixies typically require about 170 or 180 minimum voltage to ensure they ignite. This is the ripple on the low voltage smoothing capacitors. It seems like an acceptable ripple. They are probably not yet completely rotten. And the 100 Hz pulse is going into the first counter. And the second one is getting 10 Hz and so on. This is using 74 90 counters. 
and the output of one always goes into the higher one, so when it overflows from 9 to 0, the next one increments. And from each counter, the four binary outputs go into the decoder or Nixie driver. It decodes from a binary coded decimal BCD to 1 out of 10. And these have open collector NPN high voltage transistors as outputs, not normal logic outputs, so they actually control the cathodes of Nixies directly. Half an hour now. And why not make a thermal image in the meantime? You can see the anode resistor is hot, the Nixies are not actually hot, the chips are sort of warm. Of course, this is TTL logic, it's drawing about 20, 30, or 40 milliamps per chip to do these simple operations. And of course, the low voltage bridge rectifier is getting hot. This is powering all the logic, which draws in total several hundred milliamps just to do a simple counting. This is TTL 7400 logic. This is the diode separating the clock generator from the smoothing capacitor. This is sort of a stupid design. And when a resistor is getting hot, the 7805 regulator heatsink is a bit hot. The transformer isn't hot, but it has a huge thermal mass. It might take longer for it to get to its equilibrium temperature. Nothing hot in the winding, no short turns apparently. And also these electrolytic capacitors are quite cool, which is a good sign. And no chip with a significantly different temperature than the others. I suspect this decoder, but the temperature doesn't seem to be any different. Now it's running for 44 minutes, and this Nixie shows just a very dim, vague glow. And you can see its anode resistor is not hot anymore. If there was a digit shorted to the anode, it would actually draw more current, and this resistor would be even hotter. Its chip is actually a bit colder than the other chips, and the electrolytic capacitor is still completely cold. 33 degree, and this is almost the ambient here. 32, it's a hot summer here. So these capacitors neither have a high leakage current, nor a high ESR, which would be heated by the ripple current. Now could some digits be faulty in the Nixie actually? Connecting the digits to the zero volt rail and they're showing up. So it's not the digit is bad. It's most likely the decoder, but let's check the logic levels going into it. It could also be the counter actually. This is the least significant bit, bit A, 160 millivolts, this is logic zero, bit B, logic low, zero, bit C, four volts, this is logic high or one, and bit D, 100 millivolts. So it's in a binary, zero, one, zero, zero, which stands for four. The inputs need less than 0.8 volts for logic low or zero, and more than two volts for logic high or one. The decoder has the right logic levels at the inputs to display 4, but it doesn't. And when it's supposed to show 5, the inputs are from the highest. 0, 1, 0, 1. So the input signals are right. In this situation it's most commonly the decoder, but it could actually be the counter too. If the decoder was getting a prohibited combination from 10 to 15, it would also show nothing or just a vague glow. So we had to rule out a bad counter. So let's disorder the chip and replace it with something. And the bad one is out, soldering the new one in. Of course most of the traces have a tendency to come off in the process. The chip is replaced with a hopefully good one. It looks horrible, but there is actually one chip already replaced in the past, and the soldering looks actually way worse than my soldering. And of course, fixing a broken trace, replacing it using a thin wire. And hell yes, it's now working. And the 5 works, and the 6, and the 7. Now it's working well. It was the bad decoder. And these are actually hiding. 100 nanofarad capacitors. I was looking at the date codes of the components, especially the chips, and they are made between 75 and 81. And the whole machine seems to be put together in 83, so these were sitting in a storage for multiple years before being used. Talk about the just-in-time supply chain. But at least you don't get a chip shortage crisis. And the ESR of these electrolytic capacitors, they are both in parallel, 1000 micro 15 volts. About 1 ohm is ok for a 4.7 micro capacitor, and the other identical capacitor slightly under 1 ohm. That's these. 
and one capacitor here, 1.7 ohms. For 50 micro this is on the threshold of acceptable, but let's leave it there. This one is on the 5 volt rail after the 7805 regulator. Parallel to all these ceramic capacitors here. Even if this thing goes open circuit it will still work. There is a lot of ceramic capacitors here, here, everywhere. This actually came off of one of them. That's the board with all the questionable solder joints fixed and now let's put it back together. It's back together and working. Looking for some connector that fits into it for the remote control. Unfortunately the plastic covers of some of these. There are actually different versions of these that look quite similar but they are not. This one is the one I need. I just need a two-way switch, a button and some box from a power supply or a power bank or whatever this was. You can also buy some project boxes, but let's be cheap today, let's save these ones for something else. Let's not think about it too much. And that's it. And that's my new remote control. And when I press the reset button while it's running it goes to zero and when I release it, it immediately starts counting from zero. And the schematic of it I found on the internet. It's a horrible scan of a horribly printed. But anyway, the mainness comes in here via a fuse, the primary of the transformer, the two secondaries, the low voltage one is rectified here. And via the extra diode it goes into these smoothing capacitors and the 7805 regulator, some capacitors here is very poorly printed, it generates 5 volts for the logic. And also the 100 Hz ripple is tapped from here and it clocks it basically. This circuit shapes the 100 Hz ripple into a square wave for the counters. And here's the connector for the remote control. And there is the flip flop circuit which can start it and stop it. And of course the 100 Hz square wave goes into the first counter here. And from this one it continues into the next one. And it's in total six counters in a row. Each of them has a decoder and the Nixie. Two Nixies have a resistor here connecting the decimal point. Here's the high voltage power supply rectifier, a capacitor just for interference, probably 3.3 .3 nano, it's not really smoothing, this powers the anodes, all counters count up to 9 except the tens of seconds, this only counts up to 5, when it reaches 6 it resets back to 0, this logic makes this one reset after 5, but it also resets this one when all the other ones are resetting, and the reset signal comes from here, from this pin of the connector, and there is also this resistor capacitor circuit, which resets it when you plug it in, to ensure it starts at zeros. And there is also this resistor capacitor circuit, ensuring it's in the stopped position when you plug it in. But of course if you have a two-way switch instead of two momentary buttons to start it and stop it, the switch basically overrides this. And two terminals of the remote control connector are actually not used by the remote control. There was probably an option to connect it to something else. And I think they should have used here this approach to get the 100 Hz signal without introducing the unnecessary extra diode voltage drop here. And what meter time stand socket is draws 8.5 watts. By reacting it to its originally intended 220 volts, it draws 7.8 watts. So that's it and if you like my videos please consider subscribing, using the thanks button or supporting my channel on Patreon according to the value you receive from my videos. And big thanks to all of you who already support me, because this channel couldn't exist without your support.